All right. Well, Jacob, I think then we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so I'll give a, a introduction here for Dr. Jacob Jones. Um, he has a background in pediatrics and completed an additional sports medicine fellowship at the Boston Children's Hospital. Um, currently, he's practicing pediatric sports medicine at Scottish Ray um, uh, Children's in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and is also an assistant professor of pediatrics and orthopedics at UT Southwestern. Um, and a fun sports fact about him is he is actually 11th cousins with both uh, Mickey Mantle and Wilt Chamberlain. And he's going to be presenting a case today on a la uh, lateral ankle uh, pediatric avulsion case. All right. Thanks for joining everyone this morning. Uh, does that look okay? Yep, that looks good. All right. So we're going to look at uh, the lateral ankle in a pediatric patient. So no disclosures from me. Here are the objectives. We're just going to review a protocol for a pediatric patient, identify some different structures to hopefully you'll be able to distinguish between normal and abnormal findings in the lateral ankle of a pediatric patient. And then at the end, we will review an ultrasound report of the lateral ankle. So we're going to do this through a case. So there's an eight-year-old female with a right inversion ankle injury that occurred about four days ago. So it's pretty acute. She had difficulty weight bearing then and still has difficulty weight bearing now. Has been on crutches since the injury. No history of previous ankle injuries. And since the injury, she's had some swelling and continued pain and she localizes it over the lateral ankle. She plays soccer, also does a lot of PE at school, still, in, uh, still does recess at school as well. So first thing is you look at her and you see that there's no obvious deformity. There's some swelling, bruising over the lateral ankle. The skin itself looks good, no breaks in the skin. But due to the swelling, uh, there's loss of clear definition of the lateral malleolus, especially as you compare it to the contralateral side. Normal sensation, normal pulses in the foot, no worry about any compromise there. She's tender to palpation over the lateral malleolus, uh, including over near the area of the ATFL. She's got active range of motion present in all planes, although somewhat limited by the pain that she's having. We do some special testing. She's got some increased laxity with, with drawer test, a little bit of pain with uh, Taylor tilt test. Uh, your other special testing, Thompson squeeze, eversion, external rotation, all unremarkable. So first thing in this patient is we got some radiographs. So we got three views. So here's the AP view. It's a weight-bearing view. And we also got a mortise view and then a lateral view. So looking at these, we can tell that this patient is skeletally mature, or excuse me, skeletally immature based upon the presence of her um, physis and her distal fibula, distal tibia. We uh, assess that it's an appropriate uh, bone age for someone who's about eight years old. Looks like those physis is what you'd expect for someone that age. We don't see any evidence of significant fracture, at least no acute displaced fracture, um, and uh, maybe a little bit of soft tissue swelling kind of over the lateral ankle. So nothing major significant as far as bone fracture goes, but maybe a little bit of soft tissue swelling. So we're gonna ultrasound this patient. So what's an appropriate transducer and settings for the lateral ankle in this young patient? So I like to use a linear high frequency transducer, um, especially with a small footprint if you have it. So I use this hockey stick probe because it fits both of those. Think about the pediatric ankle, it's, it's small. There's uh, some bony prominences that you wanna try to work around. And so a small footprint will be really helpful. On your machine, you wanna set it to a higher frequency. The structures we're gonna be looking at are uh, superficial. So you want to try to get the best resolution that you can of those structures. And because things are superficial, you really don't need much depth. There's not a lot of tissue between the skin uh, and the bone underneath in these pediatric ankles. So just a, a couple of pointers. When you're scanning kids, 
Um, you you want to try to get the best images, like just like you do in adults. Um, but there's a couple of tricks you can do so that you can really get the best images possible. So you want to make sure you have good expectations so you get good cooperation so you get those good images. So their biggest question is always, is it going to hurt? So providing reassurance right up front that, hey, this shouldn't hurt, this shouldn't bother you. We just use a little bit of gel on you. Using better terminology for them. So I use the word camera instead of a transducer probe. Then they understand, oh, we're just taking some pictures. And then if you can, try to warm up the gel. If you have a gel warmer, you can also get gel warmers that are not part of uh, ultrasound machines as well. And that'll make them more comfortable. And then, you know, we're going to do a complete exam, which can take a little bit of time. And so trying to keep them engaged, you can do that by actually showing them the images on the screen and, and pointing things out to them and their parents. You can get some better cooperation, which will lead to some better images. So what are we going to look at? Well, if this is the lateral ankle, but certainly with lateral ankle injuries, there's also some parts of the anterior ankle that you want to check. And because this is a skeletally immature patient, the protocol I use is going to be a little bit different than what maybe you would see for an adult. Certainly, as, you, as kids get older into their teenage years and become more skeletally mature, the protocol or the things you're going to look at may be more similar to what you would look at in a, uh, in a skeletally mature adult. So on the anterior ankle, you can see the things that may be a little bit different is we're going to look at the growth plates um, as well. Um, same with the lateral ankle, where we're really interested in certain ligament and tendons, which you, you look at in adults, but we also want to assess those those physes or those growth plates to see if there's any changes there as well. So let's go through um, what we're gonna what we're gonna see here in this patient. So we're gonna start on the anterior ankle, or I like to start on the anterior ankle. This is a model of of uh, the green box is where I'm gonna place my transducer um, on the ankle, and then the red lines are either a, a physis or an apophysis, which is uh, which is what we're gonna see in this skeletally immature patient. So I'm going to place my transducer over the anterior ankle. And you can see here, we got a, a picture of the tibia itself, the distal tibia. So you can see a nice smooth bony cortex along here. As we get to the very distal end, this is the distal tibia physis down here. So don't mistake that for a, a fracture. This is what you would expect to see. What we don't see is we don't see any hematomas around it. And uh, you know, always we're not getting just we're not just looking at one single plane. You always got to scan medial and lateral along the entire tibia to make sure you're not seeing any breaks in the cortex or other hematomas around that would make you suspect that there is some type of distal tibia fracture. Um, but we don't see any of that in our patient here. So now we're just going to translate our transducer a little bit more distally. So on the left side, we have our tibia. You can still see that tibial physis there. And now we have a better view of the talus on the right side here. So this gives you a really good image, a picture of the tibiotalar joint. So for this, we want to see, hey, is there any evidence of tibiotalar joint effusion? So we don't see any um, fluid at the tibiotalar joint, which you would see down here, which would suggest um, an effusion in this area. And once again, you're going to translate both medial and lateral along the entire tibiotalar joint. Another thing you want to look for is you want to see if there's any type of osteochondral injury, especially over the tailor dome. Well, when they're just at rest, the tailor dome's a little bit covered. And so you, if you have them plantar flex a little bit, that will uncover the Taylor dome a little bit. So you can see the bone of the talus here, this nice hypoechoic, hyperechoic line right here. And then the hypoechoic on top of it is the articular cartilage. Now there are other structures that can be, or other things that can be hypoechoic, including fluid, but we can tell that this is cartilage uh, via two ways. Number one, right up here, right when the ultrasound waves are perpendicular, uh, to the hypoechoic region, we can see there's a cartilage interface sign, which is this hyperechoic or this white line um, right on top of the cartilage, which makes me think, okay, this is cartilage. The other thing that makes me think this is cartilage is certainly it's nice and smooth and linear, but you can compress the area. 
cartilage should not be compressible, whereas fluid, as you compress compress the area, um, it, it, it should move a little bit. And these are principles that are really important as we continue to scan the pediatric ankle because there's uh, there's a lot of cartilage in the ankle and you've got to distinguish between what's cartilage and, and what may be fluid or something else. So we're going to continue to translate a little bit more uh, distally. We're going to look over the Taylor neck and the talonavicular joint as well. So here we translate a little bit more distally. So on the left side, this is the very distal end of the talus. So it's the Taylor neck here. And then here is the navicular bone here. So we see that there's no not no kind of protrusions or bony spurs uh, here. We got kind of nice, normal, smooth contour of the bone, both of the talus and the end of the navicular. One thing to point out here is the actual ossified of the navicular and the talus is not uh, is is not complete. So you see right above the ossified portion, there's this slightly hypochoic region that's more hypochoic than the tissue above it. So that's the unossified cartilage of these bones here. So the actual joint isn't the entire width from the ossified portion, but you can kind of follow along here. You can follow my mouse there, and this is the actual joint between uh, the, the, two, the two bones there. But we don't see any you know, fluid hematomas, changes in the, in the soft tissues. And once again, the, the actual bony cortex looks really good. So now we're gonna move over to the actual lateral ankle portion um, of the exam. So we're gonna move our transducer over to the fibula and kind of try to center it over that distal, distal fibular physis. So here's the image of the distal fibular physis. You can see proximals here on the left. We follow the actual bony cortex. Looks really good. And then once again, we come to the actual physis. This is a normal appearing physis here. We don't see any evidence of hematoma superficial uh, to the physis. And once again, we're going to scan med or anterior, posterior to make sure we don't see any breaks in the cortex where that would suggest a fracture. You can always compare. The nice thing about ultrasound, which most of us know, is you can always compare to the contralateral side. If you're worried, oh, it looks a little bit wide. You can always compare it to the contralateral side to see if it's actually wide or not. You can also put some Doppler um, on this uh, kind of over the, 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 the physeal region um, and the periphyseal region to see if there's some increased blood flow. One word of caution with this, oftentimes you, you will see some Doppler flow in these kids, even if there's not an injury. So be careful to not overcall it. These are growing kids and the bones are growing at the physes. And so there's a lot of blood flow kind of feeding nutrients to the bones there. So just, just be careful not to call it solely, call a fracture solely based upon the Doppler findings. You need to take in the whole clinical picture um, be, before, you, before you call a fracture, uh, even if it's a non-displaced fracture that you don't really see on, on x-rays. So we're going to rotate our probe and obtain a short axis view of the perineal tendons, which kind of run right along the posterior and distal aspect of the fibula. So this is uh, an ultrasound image of what that will look like. You have the fibula on the right and it's more posterior on the left. So you can see the actual perineal tendons hug that fibula. You can see that there's no um, evidence of increased fluid around there. Um, you know, we don't often see tendinopathy in this age group like you see in the adults, but you can certainly comment that there's no thickening or obvious tears on uh, in the perineal tendons, especially as you translate proximal and posterior along the perineal tendons. Then you can just move just a little bit more posterior and check your perineal nerve. So your fibula is over here, kind of on the right side of the screen. So the sural nerve likes to hang out with the vessels here. And so the sural nerve is right in this area and you can trace that proximal and distal. And in our patient, we see there's no evidence of significant injury or abnormality to the sural nerve. Then, you know, we always wanna to try to uh, evaluate these structures in, in multiple planes, both short and long axis. And so for our perineal tendons, we're gonna rotate on it and look at those in, in long axis view. 
And so we look at this proximals on the left side of the screen. So we can see it's right next to the fibula. And we can trace this, these perineal tendons down and we can see, hey, those are normal and in, in caliber, there's no increased thickness, no increased hypoecogenicity that you'd be worried for um, kind of chronic process going on or, or no evidence of like a hypoechoic line concerning for some type of perineal tendon tear at all. So that all looks good and it looks normal there. And of course, you're going to trace these. Uh, I'm going to trace these down. So you trace those perineal tendons down all the way. And I like to trace um, trace them down to the base of the fifth metatarsal where the perineal brevis attaches. So we're going to trace that down there. And so we can see on the left side of our screen, which is proximal, the perineal tendon coming in and attaching along the base of the fifth metatarsal. So once again, this is a skeletally immature patient. So there's going to be some findings here that are normal uh, for someone that's this age. So you can see the expected hypoechoic findings surrounding the ossification of the actual metatarsal. So this is just unossified cartilage here. And we know that because it's got kind of a nice round structure if we follow it all around and we can compress on it and see that it's not movable as you'd expect to see in something like fluid. The other thing is at the base of the fifth metatarsal, there's an apophysis. And that's what apophysis is, is where the, the perineal tendon attaches to the bone. This apophysis ossifies from the lateral portion to the medial portion. And so you'll actually have an unossified region of the bone in between the two ossified region, and that is normal. So be careful not to overcall this as a fracture. We expect this unossified apophysis to be um, parallel to the direction of the metatarsal itself. So we would say in this portion, no evidence of fractures at the base of the fifth metatarsal, normal, normal appealing, appearing base of fifth metatarsal apophysis, and then we would also comment on the perineal tendons, how they are normal and caliber, um, no thickness or, or evidence of any significant tears. And then we're gonna rotate on those and get, get that picture in short axis as well. So here's the base of the fifth with the ossified portion. You can see this hypococh region between the two ossified region. That's the normal apophysis as well, just in the short axis view. You can see kind of the perineal tendon uh, attaching on top of it. All right, now we're gonna to go to the ATFL. Uh, I know people have different methods of, of finding the ATFL. The easiest method for me and the way I learned is you, you put one end of your transducer on the medial malleolus and you point the other end towards the big toe. Sometimes you have to rotate a little bit until you get the actual ATFL in, uh, in view, but it's a, it's a good starting point. So here's a picture of our patient. So we got the fibula on the left, the talus on the right. And so the green arrow here, that points to the actual ATFL uh, ligament. And so you can see it's it's normal, uh, maybe maybe a little bit loss of definition, um, but there's obvious no, you can still see the kind of the fibular, fibril or pattern that you'd expect to see in a ligament without any obvious tears. But the very proximal portion, you notice there's a piece of bone and you can kind of see that that very, very small piece of the distal fibula has actually been removed and you can see where it kind of would fit in the actual fibula itself. And then if you look closely, you can see that where the blue arrows end, um, pointing to is the hypoechoic region there. Certainly there may be a, a little bit of fluid, but remember this is, uh, the distal fibula hasn't been fully ossified yet. So this is actually um, mostly the, the distal epiphyseal cartilage of the fibula. So you can follow the actual ligament itself. You can see the ligament stops at this region, and then you get this hypochoic space or this hypochoic region between the actual avulsion um, and the bone, and that's just the cartilage uh, that's part of the, uh, the epiphysis. So we'd say that there's evidence of an acute, because it's nice sharp edges, it makes us think that this is acute, acute, um, both osteo and chondral, so osteochondral avulsion at the origin or at the proximal portion of the ATFL. 
So just to compare, here's what our patient looks like compared to a normal finding in that, that region. So see the green arrows, the, the ligament there, the red arrows, the, the avulsion, and then on the right side here, you can see this is what a normal appearance would look like in someone who doesn't have an injury in that region. And once again, you see the distal fibula, the hypoechoic unossified um, distal fibular epiphysis there. So we're gonna rotate a little bit clockwise and, and evaluate the CFL. So here's an image of the CFL. We got proximal on the left here. The CFL can act like a hammock or some people say a sling for the perineal tendons, which are right here. So the CFL is deep to those. So you can see kind of follow that CFL along as it attaches down on the calcaneus. Once again, no evidence of um, significant uh, injury that we see in the CFL. And if you're concerned there may be an injury, you can always stress that injury or stress that region and see if uh, maybe a tear uh, in the region opens up a little bit as you stress it. We're going to continue to rotate around and, and evaluate the, the AITFL. So this is kind of where you, you place your transducer. And if you can see, based upon the placement of the transducer, there's going to be uh, likely going to be images of the physis of both the, the distal tibia and the distal fibula. So you should expect to see those in a skeletal image patient. So here's the ultrasound image for this. We got the tibia on the left and the fibula on the right. You, you may look at the bone and say, well, that looks really strange. Um, but just remember that that's the actual physis there. So we've already really evaluated the physis and know that the physis itself looks, looks good. So we don't need to worry about, um, even though this may look a little abnormal, that there's no injury to that, that region. But you can see right here, the actual ligament, the AITFL, uh, normal caliber, um, connecting the fibula to the tibia, no evidence of significant tearing uh, in, that, in that ligament there. All right, so on to the report. So uh, right in the report, this is an important thing to do just for documentation and for billing purposes. And so when I write my report, I say, hey, this is what I did. And then the next is indication. So why did I do it? And the correlations. So I looked at the radiographs that I had the same day that I did the ultrasound. Then I mentioned what uh, ultrasound machine, what transducer I used here. And then I go through my findings. And so as I'm going back and writing my, my findings, I just kind of go through each image and each structure and say, all right, what did I see? Most of the time, it's going to be that I didn't see anything that was pathologic or any type of injury, but you need to comment on that. And that's part of the report. So I go through each image and say, okay, I didn't see this. I didn't see this. And I didn't see this. But then you, when you get to the images where you see injuries, you of course comment on those as well. So this is an example of, of my report based upon what we just went through. And then my conclusions based upon um, that I'll include my report are that there's a right ankle distal fibular epiphyseal osteochondral avulsion at the attachment of the ATFL. And you can also comment that this avulsion is radiographically silent. So just emphasize how, how ultrasound was helpful um, it's a helpful imaging modality in the diagnosis and eventual treatment of this patient. And then uh, I'd also comment that there's no uh, significant ATFL tear. That may have been what you were suspecting uh, prior to doing your ultrasound. So just a summary, uh, you know, you, you want to methodically evaluate all the structures. And remember that in kids, uh, you're going to have some different findings. And just don't overcall your hypocoke findings. Um, that are going to be present in your skeletal image for patients because kids have different injuries than adults. And to get your best images, just try to keep those kids engaged and comfortable. So thanks so much for your time. If anyone's interested, we're doing a pediatric MSK hands-on course next month that's taught by a lot of our faculty, our MSS members. So we still have a few open seats. You're welcome to join us if you'd like. All right, Jacob. Yeah, th thank you so much um, for that great presentation, especially, you know, all the kind of pediatric pearls, especially as far as uh, MSK ultrasound goes. Um, so I'll go ahead and just kind of open it up to any comments um, to, to begin with here from anyone that, that's on here. Hi, uh, this is Doug Hoffman. Jacob, that was um, exactly 
what you said, and that is that was a methodical, well-organized view of the or ultrasound evaluation of the lateral ankle. Um, and not only that, but um, you did really a fantastic job of just pointing out some of those small but important details that we would need to look at closely in a skeletal immature athlete. So that was a really nice job um, of doing that. And, you know, you, of course, you make it look easy doing it as well. Um, just a couple comments. Um, first is, you know, one of the goals of this is to talk about the protocol. And my heart was warmed when you started with the joint, which is I've, I've been preaching for a long time. And, and so, Jacob, would you have done anything different um, if you saw uh, not a large effusion, but a moderate effusion? Certainly, you know, when you have effusions, especially in the pediatric population, it, it makes you worry. Um, it, it makes you worry about some intra-articular pathology. And so, you know, I still would have methodically looked at all the structures, um, both over the anterior and, and lateral ankle. Certainly if my physical exam made me worry about other structures, I would look at those. But if, if the ultrasound still showed what it showed and there was a significant joint effusion, I would, I would look for more information. And so what I would do is I would get an MRI in that patient, be worried about maybe there's some cartilage or other intraarticular injury that's not revealing itself uh, on the radiographs and on the ultrasound. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree. Um, I, I would have thought of this case a little bit differently um, if I saw a significant effusion. You know, my experience in adult is with ankle sprains, they can have a small effusion and not have significant intraarticular pathology. Um, but I think a little differently in kids. So I would agree. Um, you know, there are two things that I do add to my protocol of the lateral ankle. Um, the first is the lateral subtalar joint. Um, and probably speaking a little more with my experience with adults, but I've seen some subtalar injury from lateral ankle sprains. And if I were to see an effusion in the subtalar joint, I would think differently, again, just as we discussed. And secondly, um, I wrote to, from the position, which is a coronal oblique or axial oblique, kind of right in the middle, the middle to look at the lateral subtalar joint. I rotate the probe almost 90 degrees and look at the sinus tarsi. And I do that in the lateral ankle because at the entrance to the sinus tarsi is the anterior process of the calcaneus. And I've seen both in pediatrics and adult patients, small avulsions of the anterior process, which is a bifurcate ligament avulsion. And, and so I just add that. And if I see fluid in the sinus tarsi, again, that may give clue in the subtalar joint. So I add sinus tarsi in the lateral subtalar joint as part of my protocol for all my ankles. And then the third image I add is a straight coronal image medially. And I just do one quick image um, if it's normal. It allows me to see the medial, medial tibial tailor joint. Um, but I also see the, the bones light up, the tibia, the talus, and the sustenaculum talum. And that, um, you know, especially in kids, they, they may have unrecognized coalitions. And so that allows me to see a coalition. And I have, you know, number of cases where, especially with ankle injuries, where I've seen unsuspected coalitions, the uh, talocalcaneal coalition, which uh, is difficult to see on radiographs. Um, a second comment is, you know, you did a really nice job of pointing out the physis and how important that is with kids. And my experience is, is it can be hard sometimes. And so probably top of my differential diagnosis in this history would be a Salter Harris one type fracture of the distal fibula. And that would be one of the more common injuries we see, which is a clinical diagnosis um, without imaging if it's non-displaced. And so my checklist for looking at uh, Salter Harris one type uh, distal fibular fra fractures or any really any non-displaced type one Salter Harris fractures or one is comparison views, which you pointed out. Two is edema right next to the physis. Three would be, I carefully scrutinize that periosteum because you're going to get some periosteal elevation right next to the physis, um, which 
you know, again, is, is the clue that there could be a physal injury. And then the last one, which is challenging, as you, as you point out, is Doppler imaging. And so again, I'm going to go actually do comparison Doppler imaging. And if I see increased amount of Doppler imaging on the injured side, and then of course, sonal palpatory pain would, would be a, uh, another clue. Um, as you pointed out, you know, I have a part of the protocol is the right, um, the perineal tendons, but especially in this case, I'm really honing in on the details of the superior perineal retinaculum. And in particular, looking for those fibers, that fibular echo texture onto the fibula to look for any periosteal stripping, because that's going to be a clue that the superior perineal retinaculum was involved. And on your really nice view of, of the short axis of the perineal tendons, you saw this little hyperechoic triangle. Um, which, which is fibrocartilage. And that often is injured uh, with, um, you know, with this perineal tendon involvement. Just a small detail, but um, on your perineus brevis image, that long axis, the fibers spread out on your image there. Um, so the brevis attaches on and actually doesn't fan out. And then the lateral cord of the plantar fascia spreads out onto the base of the fifth metatarsal. So I think you got a fair amount of lateral cord on that image. And, and I feel that it's the lateral cord that causes the avulsion fracture and not the brevis. Because if you look at the footprints, the lateral cord uh, has the majority of the footprint onto the base of the fifth metatarsal. And then lastly, you know, with your uh, pathologic image of the ATFL um, reminds me that it seems like the majority of injuries of the ATFL occur on the fibular side uh, rather than the Taylor side because the Taylor attachment is much more robust. Um, and so <clears throat> um, I always scrutinize that side very carefully. And the other thing it reminds me is, you know, I've, I've learned over time with ultrasound that these small avulsion fragments, even if we see them on radiographs, so I'm thinking about the UCL of the thumb, I'm thinking about the volar plate of the finger, most commonly, they do not involve the, a complete detachment of the ligament. It's a partial detachment, which your image actually, I believe, shows. And so stress testing, I would, I would probably not stress test this person, um, but stress testing uh, is probably perfectly safe to do um, because, again, the thought was we shouldn't be stress testing an avulsion fracture. But my uh, experience is, again, is that these avulsion fragments um, do not involve the full, print, full footprint of the ligament. So anyway, a lot of good talking points, um, but the bottom line is yeah, boy, I learned a lot there and, and it really methodically went through each structure very well, Jacob. Thanks for your comments and, and for your thoughts. Sure, appreciate it. Yeah, Doug, thanks for the um, additional comments there. Um, one thing I was going to say then, yeah, is it kind of piggybacking after the, the last part is that, um, yeah, I mean, in some of these cases, I think obviously doing dynamic scanning um, can be, you know, extremely helpful to kind of tell, um, you know, more significant partial tear um, versus complete tear. But as Doug had mentioned, you got to be a little bit careful, um, obviously, with these avulsion fractures. Typically then for the dynamic um, maneuvers, obviously trying to uh, perform an anterior drawer. Uh, Jacob, do you have like a preferred way of, of doing the dynamic testing if you are going to kind of include that? Um, usually, you know, seeing this both done kind of prone or, you know, seated for some of these patients. I'll typically do it seated. And, you know, I usually have someone with me to help take pictures. And so I'll Kind of have one hand focused on just holding holding the probe. Unfortunately, these kids have small feet, and so I feel like I can use one hand to do the actual maneuver, and the other hand to focus or to kind of hold that probe steady as I'm moving it. So, just you know, some unpublished data. Hopefully, it'll be published published soon. But Kentaro Nishi and his um, Japanese orthopedic surgeon colleagues they have a biomechanics lab um, at Pittsburgh and. And they looked at this and they looked at all the different methods of stressing the ATFL and good news came out of this. And they felt from their biomechanics lab that the most accurate way to stress test the ATFL was a 30 degrees plantar flexion and then internal rotation of the, of the ankle. And that's something that I can easily do by holding the probe on and uh, as well as doing the stress test myself. 
um, versus, let's say, an anterior jaw test. And so, again, this was really good news because I've started using that method over the last year or so and been really happy with it. So 30 degrees plantar flexion and internal rotation is how I do my ATFL stress. Thanks for that, Doug. Um, you know, two other things that I was going to comment, you know, as, as well, too, um, sometimes for the protocol, you actually had, you know, a view of it, but was of that uh, dorsal tailor navicular, you know, joint. Um, but sometimes also taking a look at the the ligament at this location as well, too, is because of a, a couple of patients I have had, you know, avulsion fractures um, and ligament tears at that location as well, too. Um, which obviously for, for those patients, they can have a little bit more prolonged um, recovery. Um, but the one thing I, you know, really appreciated in the kind of report that you had mentioned as well, too, just for that avulsion fracture, really kind of the two basic things that you're going to be looking for is obviously that kind of cortical, you know, step off, you know, off that distal fibula, but in addition, more so than anything else as well, too, is just correlating, do they have sonar palpation tenderness, you know, at that, that area. And I think those are obviously going to be the, the two biggest things um, to be looking for diagnostically, you know, for these avulsion, you know, type fractures. Um, but Jacob, as, as Doug had mentioned, um, you know, excellent presentation, kind of everything that we're looking for and, and definitely really appreciate all the kind of pediatric pearls that you were able to provide with this case. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining everyone. All right. Well, um, unless there's any other comments or questions, um, then we'll go ahead and um, close this out.